A helical antenna is a simple wire antenna that could be operated in one of two main ways. Either as an electrically short dipole or monopole, which is relevant in the case of mobile HF helicals because the wavelength is massive as compared to the size of the handheld, a problem not necessarily shared by VHF and UHF devices, or as an axial mode helical, wherein the antenna radiation pattern is a circularly polarized pattern that's directional along the axis of the helix. In this context, the helical becomes a very useful antenna for first-person view video feeds. Back in the early 2010s, this was the go-to antenna, but now we're starting to see modern patch antennas crop up as the traditional directional default. So, in today's world, why would you still want to use a helical antenna as opposed to a modern patch antenna? Well, for cheap, low-profile patches that are built on FR4 epoxy, the FR4 epoxy dielectric is far more lossy than the air dielectric that typically exists in a helical. As a result, the beam width of a helical antenna for the same gain should be much larger than the beam width for a patch antenna of the same gain. If we compare a three-turn helix on the Jay Coppins website calculator, we could see that the beam width is 62.6 .6 degrees with a gain of 8.3 dBi. To compare this to a commercial product, we'll look at the Immersion RC Spironet LHCP Mini Patch 8 dBi. We can see that in their product specs, they claim a gain of 8 dBi and a beam width of 45 degrees. So the Helix will give you moderately more beam width for the same gain, which is to say it is a less lossy antenna. In addition, many patch antennas that are built on PCBs directly have very poor bandwidth. That's, that's often a plus in the case of things like GPS antennas, where GPS is surrounded by other services and you want to pick out just the GPS signals. Narrow bandwidth helps you to isolate what you're looking for. But in the case of FPV, particularly 5.8 gigahertz, we have a massive band that's allocated for this purpose. It's almost 400 megahertz. Some frequencies are down as low as 5.6 gigahertz and some almost as high as 6 gigahertz. So a patch antenna might not have the best bandwidth when compared to a helical antenna. So now we, that we know that there might be a bandwidth and a beam width advantage for using a helical antenna, how do we build one? Well, first, we need to find a 3D printed scaffold for the antenna. So this is a open SCAD project on Thingiverse where you can customize the size of a helical antenna to make it for any frequency that you want. Most people make them for 5.8 gigahertz FPV, but you could, in theory, make this for 1.3, 2.4, even 3.3 gigahertz or 3.4 gigahertz, whatever the band is in your country. So all you need to do to use this file is download the open SCAD file, open it up, and then specify the parameters. In this case, we're going to be building a 5.8 gigahertz right-hand circular polarized five-turn helical antenna. So I'll need to input the relevant parameters from the J. Coppins calculator for a five-turn helix. So if we go back to the calculator, 5800 megahertz will be our center frequency, five turns. That tells us that we're going to be getting a gain of 10.27 dBi, a beam width of 48.4 degrees. Now, the relevant parameters for the program, we need to know our total antenna length, which is 59.4 millimeters. That goes in the L variable here. We need to know the diameter of our wire. I'm going to be using two millimeter diameter wire, so I'm going to print the holes with three millimeters of diameter so that there's a little tolerance. You want to go at least one millimeter over the size of your wire so it's easier to thread the wire into the scaffold. Then we need to know the diameter of the helix, which is 17.5 millimeters, the number of turns, the polarization, and we need to tell the program what to print. In this case, I already have a jig for winding the coil, so I'm just going to print the frame. But if you weren't just going to print the frame, you would have to specify everything as opposed to just the frame, and then it would compile with the jig. And this is what you would use to wind the wire. So once we download that file and generate an STL, which can take quite some time, because I don't think that OpenSCAD actually has GPU acceleration, so it tries to generate the STL on that complicated file, all using your CPU. It, it can take upwards of 10 minutes, depending upon how large the mesh is. We'll take that and bring it into our favorite slicer, Prusa Slicer. And remember, I'm printing the version without the jig.
This part needs to be precise in the vertical, uh, sorry, in the horizontal more than the vertical. So you can print at a pretty high layer height. I'm printing at 0.3 millimeter draft quality with 20% infill, and this worked pretty well for me in PLA. Print time's on the order of 50 minutes. So we export the G code and print it, and then we'll get on with the construction. So for our build, you're going to need the following. The 3D printed helical antenna scaffolding, the 3D printed wire winding jig, some RG402 coax, which is great for the solder type SMA connectors, a solder type SMA connector of your choice, either RPSMA or SMA, typically male, a piece of heat shrink tubing, some copper clad FR4 board. I like the double sided stuff because it gives a better mechanical connection than the single sided one, and some super glue. So first you need to take some copper wire. This copper wire is about two millimeters in diameter. So I size the holes in the coil supports for three millimeters and insert it into the jig for bending the coil. This is a right-hand circuit polarized jig. You'll have to make sure that you have the right-hand one and not the left-hand one if you're making a right-hand antenna. And just coil it around, following the grooves. Once you get to the end, go ahead and bend it a little bit past the end of the coil bending jig, and then cut it. Then you'll need to snake it off. I find it's easy to just cut the part that was in the the anchor point hole there out. I've used this jig quite a number of times. I've actually enlarged the anchor point hole so it's easier to get it out, but I still usually just go with cutting the wire. It's a lot easier. Next you're going to need to put the coil supports together, and we're going to snake the wire coil onto the coil supports. You'll want to be pushing the wire through from as far up as you can, but it's preferable to be inside the coil supports as opposed to outside, because if you're outside, you may very well bend the coil. It's easier to get a grip there, but gripping at the top one is a reasonable compromise. Uh, it's okay to push from outside, you just need to make sure that you don't bend the coil. So we're gonna bend that coil all the way down through. So once you snake the wire on there, you want to make sure that the end of it is on the side of the base that does not have a protruding support leg. And then we'll move on to the next step, which is sizing the reflector. So I'm using double-sided uh, copper FR4 board for this reflector. You only need single-sided, but double-sided makes it easier to get the coax to have a grip on the board. Here I am measuring the reflector size there. Uh, it does measure to the outer bit of the base. Now I'm going to first measure a larger reflector, I think on the order of 35 millimeter, and then I'm going to cut it down to size at the 31.5 millimeter mark, which is the minimum given by the calculator. Now you could do these cuts with a hacksaw. I usually just use a Dremel tool. Uh, once you size the board down, though, you do have to be careful that you can uh, keep a grip on it and uh, that copper surface will get hot. Also, probably not the greatest idea to be breathing in that board dust, so if you want to wear a mask or uh, do this in well-ventilated area, that'll be a good idea. So here I am making the more precise measurement of 31.5 millimeters, and then I'm gonna trim it down again. Now the resulting reflector should fit reasonably snug. If it comes out crooked or a little bit too large, you can just hit it with the Dremel again and then get it to fit nicely. Next I'm going to check to make sure the base plate fits on there good. You can see that everything looks fine. And now we're going to have to drill the hole for the coax connector. So I'm just going to mark that spot with a pencil and then we'll start at a relatively small size drill bit. I think I used a 5 64ths. 
Now here's me drilling the final hole in the FR4 board to fit the RG402. The size came out to 9 sixty-fourths, which is just over the 0 .140 inches that the outer diameter should be, as according to the spec sheet. So now we have to measure the length of our transmission line, approximately. I'm going to oversize it a little bit, but I'm going to go for a full wavelength transmission line at 5.8 gigahertz. So that's going to be 5 centimeters long, thereabouts. So I'm measuring just a little bit longer than 5 centimeters, and then I'm going to cut it down to size when I put on the final coax connector. After you cut that to size, we'll trim the coax, get rid of the shield and the dielectric. Keeping the center conductor, make sure that's straight. We're going to be soldering to that in a minute, too. So I've heated up the soldering iron. We got the board in the helping hands. And we're just going to solder the shield of the coax to both sides of the PCB. It's only really necessary to solder it to the top side of the PCB. But I find that you get a better connection between the coax and the board by soldering both sides. Not an electrical connection so much as a physical connection, because this coax is going to get bent so we can point the antenna in the direction that we want to. So just make sure you go all the way around the connector, and we'll do this process on both sides. You should have a nice blob of solder completely around the coax on both sides of the board. There should be no gap. Next, it's time to fit everything together. So I've checked that the board fits in the reflector holder. And now I'm going to place the coil assembly into the reflector holder. You can see that those three legs just kind of rest in there. And they're going to grab onto the FR4 board right there. It's just going to slide in. Make sure that the coax connector is on the side that does not have the leg. Once you get that in there, you're going to want to bend the coil wire to line up with the coax connector, or the coax connector to line up with the coil wire. And then go ahead and trim any extra length from the coax connector center conductor or the uh, copper coil. Then we're going to solder those together. After you've got that soldered together, you're going to want to make sure there is not a short between the center conductor and ground. If you had a short, that would represent a extreme mismatch condition and could really damage your transmitter. If you're using this as a receive antenna, it's uh, not going to destroy your receiver, but it wouldn't be good either. So here I am soldering a little bit, about an eighth of a turn along the first coil. I'm just tinning that spot because we're going to be soldering to that the IB Crazy wave trap matching network right there. So this is a matching method. It's going to get our SWR down from around 2 to 1 to 1.5. IB Crazy pioneered this a number of years ago in the early 2010s. So what it is is a 1 16th by 1 8th wavelength uh, piece of metal that gets soldered one eighth of the way on the first turn of a helical antenna like this. Why does it work? I honestly have no idea. I simulated it in HFSS and it did work to some extent. It brought my simulated SWR down by like 0.5 from 2.3 to like 1.8 uh, on the antenna I had. I wasn't feeding it exactly right, which is why I think that the SWR was higher than the real world performance value. But it does work. It's magic. So you're going to want to make this uh, wave trap match out of some kind of flat metal. Uh, my first thought was to use aluminum foil, but that doesn't work too well. It's, it's difficult to solder to that. I've had good success with little scraps of flattened brass, and I've also had success with tape measure. Here I'm going to use a little scrap of flattened brass because it's a little bit thicker than tape measure, easier to work with. 
at these frequencies. So an eighth wavelength by sixteenth wavelength at five gigahertz, five point eight gigahertz is going to be three by six millimeters. So this is pretty small. You're going to measure it with a caliper. I found the best way to uh, make this is to just go at it with a Dremel and a pair of pliers until it uh, sizes up right on the caliper. So I'm going to go ahead and do that right now, and then we'll solder it on. So once you've got it down to size, you're going to want to tin it. Probably don't do that on your meltable soldering mat like I did here. Probably hold it in a helping hands. But in any case, so you have that tinned, and you have the copper wire at the base of the coil tinned. So you're not going to need to add additional solder to get this to stick on. It makes your job so much easier that you just have to heat up two existing solder pads and touch them together. Here I am just applying heat to the coil and heat to the brass patch and we'll get that to stick on there in just a second. You want to make sure that you don't apply the heat for too long so if you're not getting it to stick after a couple seconds you want to take the heat off and try again in a little bit because that PLA that we printed this out of will warp if you heat the coil for too long. Now comes the step in the assembly where we put the reflector case housing together. I like to use super glue for this because it doesn't expand a lot when it dries and it tends to hold these two things together pretty well. So I'm using the green Gorilla Glue gel version. This is the super glue gel, not the 24 hour Gorilla Glue version. And we're going to take the reflector base pad and stick it on there. And now you're going to need to hold it in place. You could uh, use tape or zip ties, but I generally just take C clamps and clamp it together on three or four sides and that will hold it together. So now we're back here after that glue is dry and I'm just going to check to make sure it's together. And then we're going to go ahead and add the coax connector of your choice to the end of that line, making sure that we trim the line to the proper length first. So here I am measuring the line. Remember that we're going with a full wavelength in this case. So we have plenty of bending room. So that'll be five centimeters. The way to measure this is that the coax, where you have the complete coax cable, should be five centimeters long. So the center conductor doesn't count as part of the length, just the coax. So you want to make sure that you measure from the point where the coax touches the reflector and converts into just the wire. And now we'll start the process of soldering on an SMA connector. In this case, I'm using a normal SMA because these will be going on my Attitude V5s, which have a normal SMA female on them. This is different than the RP SMA. The RP SMA on the screw side of the connector has a hole, and the normal SMA connector has a point. So you want the point and then the screw connector part. So here I am soldering the center conductor connector piece of the male SMA connector. So what I did is I tinned the center wire and then I just heat it up and I use pliers to stick the connector onto the center conductor. If it doesn't go in all the way, you can pick the antenna up and uh, heat it up again and push the center conductor against a metal surface. That tends to help sometimes and I ended up having to do that. Next I'm going to add some shrink tubing. I did this off camera. I like to color code my coax cables. Red means right hand circular polarized and blue means left hand circular polarized in my convention. Uh, it's important to remember to put the, uh, <laughs> the shrink tube on before you solder the connector. If you solder these connectors all the way on, you're going to have a really hard time getting them off, uh, especially just this particular RG402 version. Also, you want to make sure that you push that that heat shrink tubing as far back as possible because the heat is going to travel up that shield and it can shrink the tubing prematurely. 
So here I find if you grab with the helping hands on the outer edge of the SMA connector, it allows it to still rotate freely. So now we can just get a little solder on there, heat it up, spin it a little, add some more solder, heat it up, spin it a little. And what you want is the same type of thing we had when we were soldering the coax shield to the FR4 board, a nice blob of solder that goes all the way around the connector. Now you can see my heat shrink tubing is starting to shrink, so I want to make sure that I don't get too much heat there. Uh, I think I do stretch it a little bit to try and stop that. Let it cool down just a little so it doesn't shrink too much as I try to frantically place it on the connector. And uh, what I do is I just real quick shove it over before it's able to shrink, and then it'll shrink right on there where I want it to. So this is our final product, a one wavelength transmission line, five turn helical antenna with IB Crazy wave trap matching for 5.8 gigahertz, right hand circular polarization. While I'm getting the goggles, a couple things to note. If we're gonna put this antenna on a receiver, we have almost nothing to worry about other than getting a bad signal. There's no significant power going to the antenna, so we're not gonna damage something that's connected to it. If you're gonna stick this on a transmitter, however, you may want to either invest in directional couplers or an SWR meter for the frequency you're using so that you can make sure it's a good matching before you possibly subject your transmitter to lots of reflected power. Alternatively, you could test it and see how well it works as receiving antenna, and if it works significantly well, then it's probably a good matching anyway, and I'd be willing to chance it on cheaper video transmitters. Now we'll go ahead and attach that to the goggles, and here's the result. If you like this video, please consider leaving a thumbs up or subscribing for more content.